Hey guys, in this video, we're gonna take an in-depth look at the broadcast audio setup at Mission Hills Church. So we're currently in the auditorium at Mission Hills Church. This church happens to be less than five minutes away from the church front headquarters, so I don't know why we haven't come here sooner to show you guys what they got going here, because it's pretty exciting. But we're here, and we have Mr. Andrew Leopard is with us today. Um, Andrew, what's your role here at the church? Uh, so I am the AVL specialist, which is basically a bunch of random tech stuff and then kind of more focused on the broadcast audio area. Awesome. Cool. So let's go ahead. Uh, you guys can see we're in the auditorium now. So they got stadium seating, just kind of give you perspective of where we're at. Let's uh, walk back to the production suite and check out your studio. So here they've got video world, everything video back in this room and then They've got the audio suite over here. Very nice. All right, so let's just go ahead. All we're gonna do in this video is have you unpack for us how you produce an amazing broadcast mix. How do you do it? Tell us all, all your secrets, all the things. All the Break it down, all right? So, so, I mean, obviously, maybe we can make another video someday about how you guys are capturing you know, audio at the source with, with your sound reinforcement on stage and things like that, but let's assume we know that by now, and we're really just working on, let's talk about audio routing, how you're getting audio to and from this room, yep. and then processing, how you how you processing it, and tell us all your uh, secrets of how you, all, all, the, all the wonderful trade secrets of making an awesome mix. <laughs> cool, yeah, uh, so the way we get audio to this room is we have a uh, OptiCore network that we have a bunch of different stage racks on, and then we also have uh, some Dante coming in um, for, Primarily the the vocal mics because are those like wireless uh, yeah. receivers? Yeah. So are they sure like uh, yeah wireless accent uh, and then the only other thing we have is for all the like uh, PVP computers or pro presenter computers we have um, those coming in through Maddie So we just have direct channels from that from the broadcast room over there Awesome. All right, then give us a kind of a rig rundown of what we're looking at here. Yep, uh, so we have a SD12, um, and we have the 96 channel uh, upgrade to it. So we've got 96 uh, channels there, and then we have waves, um, and then we have some Focal monitors. So break down for us, um, where does the SD12 fall in the line of Digico consoles? Because that's a little bit, a little bit bougie for my taste, so I'm not aware of the, those line of consoles, but where, where does it fall kind of in their lineup? Yeah, um, it, it's pretty in the middle, I would say. So there, there's um, what, SD11, SD9, and then I think the Quantum 225 probably falls under this just because it has less channel count. Um, and then you have SD12, and then um, like SD5, SD7, uh, 338 is probably below SD5, but. Yeah, why, why'd you guys go, as a, why'd you go with this guy? Um, it was just a good fit for the channel count we needed. Um, and it's a bigger surface than some of the, the smaller ones without being you know, as expensive as the ones that have three banks and everything, so. Awesome. Anything else we should know about the SC12? Why, why you enjoy using it for a broadcast, specifically a broadcast mix yeah. environment? Um, I really like Digico specifically because it's just so flexible. You can route things anywhere you want. You can route buses to buses. Um, it just gives you ultimate flexibility. Um, part of that is you can get yourself in trouble, but as long as you're a little bit careful, it's a fantastic console to use. Awesome. And then you're pairing it with Waves. Yes. Yeah, so we have the ability to send up to 64 inserts to Waves. Um, and we're doing most of the channels that come off the stage are going through waves. Um, all the, the track stuff isn't, I'm just processing that in the desk. Um, my personal preference is to do most of the EQ on the console side and then do more of the compression and maybe dynamic EQ and stuff in waves. Okay, so give us a breakdown of like your plug-in chain for, or processing chain for like the lead vocalists? Like how, walk us through once it enters the console or waves, like where, where it's going and what plugins it's going through. Yeah, so uh, lead vocal goes through this channel strip right here. I have the channel EQ going um, and I have the compressor on also, but it's really not hardly touching anything. 
Um, and then it goes into waves, and I have, um, it's a little bit of a convoluted chain right now, but it's uh, F6 that's just doing EQ, then NS1 um, to just get rid of a little bit of noise that's on the stage. Uh, this past weekend, we had the drum set about five feet behind the vocals, so lots of drum bleed, lots of processing to try and get rid of that. Uh, after that, we have CLA-2A, um, then we have another F6, and this is the one that I have moving, so we'll, later on I can play some stuff and you'll see it moving to dynamically compress some stuff or EQ it, I guess. Uh, then a de -esser. Um, then another EQ, just doing a little bit of correction. Um, then PSE, again, just to try and clean it up as much as I possibly can to get rid of the drum bleed and then pitch correction. So yeah, tell us about the Stream Deck. Yeah, so the Stream Deck is really useful just for being able to quickly switch between things. Um, in the past, I've had some systems with waves that are touch screen, and it's kind of useful to get around quickly, but it, it's not as useful as I would like it to be, and I found this does basically the same. So I can quickly say, I want BGV1, and that's the pitch correction for that, or lead vocal pitch correction, or acoustic guitar pitch correction, or not pitch correction, just all the plugins that we have on it. Um, and then the main thing I'm also using it for is these two buttons are previous and next snapshots, so for key changes for the pitch correction, all I have to do is just hit next and it switches the key over for between the songs. Okay, so those are snapshots in waves, in, in sound grid, so that'll apply key changes to the, the, that one plugin? Yeah, so if you go to like, uh, this is the lead vocal, if I hit next snapshot, it changes from C to G, and then next again goes to A flat. Oh, perfect. Um, and we have it set up so that it only is able to affect the, the, the last plugin on the vocal chain. So everything else is recall safed. Um, but these buttons are all just shortcuts to be able to get to the different channels specifically. So really you've got kind of a I think whenever you're using waves to this extent, a hybrid of the mixing in a box like a DAW, but also having a real dedicated hardware console, yeah. seems like a pretty awesome setup. Yeah, I, I very much like the the mixing in a box and on a console perspective, just because I'm such a like a hands-on mixer that I feel like I have to have faders, but want to have the flexibility of a lot of the features of a DAW. Yep. I guess the, the one big thing that's, that's nice about a DAW, if you're just using that, is it's pretty simple to just record at, while you're actually mixing as well, yep. record the multi-track in that DAW. Um, so what are you doing, though, for multi-track recording? Yeah, so uh, the way that we're doing it is we have a laptop over here that just has Reaper on it, um, and that records all of our inputs. Um, we're doing it a little bit of a non-traditional way. So on Digico's, there are two insert points, um, and we've decided to just have waves always be the B insert, which is after EQ and compression and everything, and have the A insert be our um, Reaper insert. So we just have them there but off, so it's not actually going through Reaper and coming back, but it is sending the audio that way. That way if we, you know, it's always going to be the piano channel, even if on stage we're switching the input depending on where the piano is on the stage or such. So the raw audio comes from inputs on stage, but they, they, they all go to... So basically, we're taking whatever input it is on the stage and routing it to the channel, okay. and then no matter what it is, it always records to the same channel in Reaper. Okay. Okay. So that way, when we go back to do playback, if there's a varying weekends have different channels for stuff, it'll still come from the same place when we go to playback later. Got it. Because yeah. the only variable is the patching from the stage to the input of this board, but then the patching will always stay the same from here to there. Right. Okay, got it. But we do more than you'd think of changing things on stage, so yeah. that's why we have to end up doing it this way. Yeah, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then Reaper is just getting the, it's, but it is getting raw, just the raw audio. It is getting, um, technically there's high pass filter, low pass filter on it, but essentially raw before anything is processed, all of that. Um, yeah, that's the way we're doing it for now at least. Got it, cool. Uh, so these speakers are Focals. Um, they're, they're, they're great. Um, 
But one thing I would say is just it, having expensive speakers doesn't mean you don't need to tune your room. Um, it's, it's a pretty night and day difference between when these have been phase aligned and then also toned. So the actual like curve of the EQ coming out of them set to be what makes sense, at least for this room, um, transformed them from solid to pretty great. Awesome. Yeah, so you said this room, we were talking a little bit earlier, you said you got some acoustic treatment in here, you can yep. see we got some absorption on this back wall, um, but you're, you're hoping for more eventually. Yeah, we actually have, we bought a curtain to cover up this big glass window, but we haven't put it up yet. But yes, yeah, we're going to end up doing more just because um, you can just tell that I'm losing a little bit of detail with reflections happening compared to like if I put in my in-ears and listen to it. Uh, so one thing that I'm doing that's a little interesting is I'm actually taking the bass channel and duplicating the input into another channel and then doing a hardware insert of a tone hammer and micro synth, which is the hardware units that actually Bethel uses to get their bass sound. And then I route that back in um, to be able to um, you know, feather that in at times and you know, blend it with the original sound. Uh, so that's actually just a monitor output of the console. So it'll it'll show like snapshots on it. Okay. Um, yep. But I can also just see them there. Oh, got it. Cool. And then of course we got your multi view going on up here, so you can yep. see what's going on. Very important. Yes, it's not everything, but it's most of the important stuff. Um, and I have. We have the ability to do different screen setup for what's happening in the room and what's on stream. So this is the primary one, and every once in a while I have to look at this one, which is just the just for stream video. What's the uh, other screen on top of the multi-view for? Uh, that's just another screen off of the Waves computer. So I have my master bus compressor and limiter up there that I can kind of glance up quickly at and see how I'm doing for that. Um, and then I also have... Uh, just Waves setup page open to see if it's throwing any errors and gonna freak out on me or anything. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah. Well, that's smart because it's like right next to you know the program or wherever you're looking yeah. at. It, it's nice and convenient to just glance up and make sure that everything's doing okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk mixing strategy, mixing approach. Yeah. Give us a kind of breakdown of once like, how are you doing a lot of um, like I guess to me I like I always love seeing how people are grouping things and creating buses for things yeah. before they hit the master bus. Like, so give us kind of big picture breakdown of, of what that looks like for your setup or your kind of philosophy of just creating that broadcast mix that is dynamically, it's, it's gonna sound nice and smooth and controlled and consistent, yeah. um, and, et, et, et cetera. Totally. Um, so here, I'll just pull up a snapshot for a song. Um, so the way the desk is laid out is basically I have instruments over here, um, vocals, and then essentially like effects and like crowd mics for the room. Um, and this one over here that's red is a uh, group that I have coming from all of the drums. So all of the drums feed into this group that is able to be, I have a, a little bit of EQ going on it, I have a waves compressor on it, um, I'm able to do you know, whatever processing I want to that specific group, that's all the drums. Um, and then I send that to, um, that one actually just goes straight to master um, after the drums. But what I have set up is, in order to be able to time align everything, I have all the uh, instruments, not only time aligned in waves, so they're, they're all a part of a group. Um, and then those go to what I call pre-master, which is just a group of things before master. Um, I'm not doing any processing on that at all other than delay to get it to line up with everything. And then the vocals are a little bit different. I have vocals going to um, another group that's just vocals that has clean processing through it and just delay. And then I have another one that is the parallel vocal. So I'm just doing it actually in the console, um, but it's just a little bit of um, EQ on it and then a fairly decent amount of compression on the whole vocal group. Um, I find it kind of just glues it together a little bit and then actually has the vocals kind of just like stick out and pop. Something else I'm doing that's kind of interesting with that is um, 
I don't use it for very many things, but it's really useful for the things that I do use it for, is it's a group that I call just a spread group. Um, and all that it is, is uh, essentially a stereo group that has one side delayed about 10 milliseconds. And it does, I think it's called the has effect or something like that. Um, but it basically just makes it feel like instead of it being in front of you, it's over here, but both sides. Um, and I've been doing that a lot with like acoustic guitar um, and this past weekend violin also. Um, it makes it feel like it's around you instead of just in front of you or like actually placed somewhere which is good for an acoustic guitar, kind of turns it into almost like a shaker during big parts of the songs. So this tells me how loud I am and uh, just gives me a visual representation of like, basically it travels around and it just shows me like the past minute I think of where I've been as far as how loud, um, just keeps me consistent. What's a, what's like a recent like uh, trick that you've implemented that you may have recently learned about that you're like, oh, this is so cool. Like, I'm yeah. Um, so is this, this specifically is useful when mixing on, like half the time I'm mixing on my in-ears. Um, and it's been really useful with that because sometimes when you mix in headphones, it's a little t hard to tell like how loud things are in comparison to others compared to speakers. Um, and so I actually, I created a macro that just basically cuts um, the low end and the high end off of it, just, just the solo bus. So it doesn't affect anything that anyone else is hearing, but I'm able to hit that and it cuts like two or 300 to four to 5K. Um, and it just gives you kind of a, it, it almost feels like you're listening on different speakers and just gives you a little bit of a different perspective. And especially on headphones really helps keep things easier to balance. What are, what's a future upgrade you want to implement? Um, good question. Uh, we've definitely been talking about doing a uh, extreme server for waves just because it can't hurt and we, we, uh, we've had a few issues with it freaking out on us, never during a service, thankfully, but enough times to make me a little anxious. Um, I've considered doing a, another, like, like, like a DAW to be able to do a few inserts of just be able to do the things you can do in DAW that you can't just do in Waves or on a console. Because um, you're limited to Waves plugins. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to be able to do some, like, Soothe or some some of those fun plugins like that, but and you, you guys aren't you're not doing any replacement of anything, right? No, I've also considered doing that, um, but I for the most part, I'm pretty happy with where we're able to get without it, so it's probably not worth the hassle. I I rely pretty heavily on snapshots, so um, we have a bunch of different snapshots for this. Is just you know walk in where nothing's happening, and then we go to different music, and then there's I mean, here's like a welcome. So we have at the beginning of the service, he, he talks, the lead worship leader says something to the people, um, but then someone else is actually leading that song. So I have it set up. So he's up, effects are down. The rest of the band is basically where it's gonna be. And then the song starts and effects come up and the, the vocal that's actually singing pops that's up. Cool. Uh, you're able to adjust the time of how quickly those snapshots engage. You can, cool. it, it's really detailed. So you can actually affect not only just the overall snapshots, but each channel individually within that. So I have one for, from the bumper going into the message, I have it set up so that it'll fade the bumper down really slowly, but it pulls up the pastor mic really quickly so that I don't miss uh -oh. yeah. that. Well, Man. this time it's slow because of weird week, but yeah. Because I mean, all, all digital consoles do that. I don't know if once, like, you know, a lower end console gives you the ability to actually like time out those crossfades. The the issue that I've run into a lot with a lot of the lower end consoles is they don't have the fade. They just do hard cuts yeah. to them, yeah. which you can do. I've done it and it's totally fine, but you kind of have to pick the right moment and kind of sneak it in instead yeah. of here where you can just hit it whenever and it'll fade between them nicely. So it's a pretty significant help to be able to have them fade like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we have it set up so that we have the phone to be able to talk to the person at front of house and then um, call button. And when he needs to talk to me, this light just flashes and I pick up the phone and talk. That light, is it built into the console? No, it's, uh, it's just oh. taped onto there. Oh, okay. we, it's, uh, it's just USB'd into the ClearCom system, and um, yeah. Any concluding uh, thoughts or tips to share for folks wanting to improve their mix? 
Uh, just don't be afraid to use your console. The EQs and compressors are there for a reason. They don't have to look pretty. Make it sound good, not look good. Thanks so much for the tour, Andrew. And I have a feeling we'll be back here to look at other elements of your guys' system that we have here. Um, and for people to check it out, is it missionhills.org? Yes. Go to their website, you can check out their stream, hear what it sounds like for yourselves, guys. But, and, and what you do here will be the result of this. The Digico plus Waves plus Andrew. Well, and plus all the other there are volunteers about half the time, but people who, who do great things down down on stage. You do have volunteers who mix as well. Yeah, so I, I'm only mixing about maybe half the time, cool. but I'm kind of trying to shape the vision for it. Yeah, awesome. Well, cool. Thanks, man. Yeah. We'll see you next time. Sounds good.